Hello BookTube! I mentioned in another video today that today has been oddly busy for me, an oddly active day. Usually I'm happy as a clam, but hardly moving, except when I'm walking the little bean outside. Uh, but I had a number of errands to run today, and one of those errands, uh, I knew it was going to be melancholy. It turned out to sting a lot more than I was expecting. Uh, I've mentioned uh, on this channel before that the big Barnes & Noble, the retail bookstore chain, here in the United States. The big Barnes & Noble store at the Prudential Center in Boston is closing in June. No plans to relocate Barnes & Noble as a company, aside from the store that is run by Boston University, uh, is leaving the city of Boston. And the city of Boston will therefore have no large retail bookstores at all. A uh, couple of enduring little bookstore cafes but no, nothing like the big book emporium that we all got used to in the 1990s. That will be gone. It will be, for the first time in well over three centuries, it will be possible to walk from one end of the city to another, to walk through five, six, even ten neighborhoods without encountering a bookstore of any kind. Uh, and that would be melancholy enough, but also I worked at the Barnes & Noble that is closing in June. Uh, the Barnes & Noble that's closing in June was the, the last retail bookstore where I worked. I have uh, a photograph taken by a then friend of me uh, in my last few minutes at a at retail bookstore information desk, which was once upon a time, for a very long time, 25 years, uh, my natural habitat. Uh, I walked away from that information desk, stopped working at that Barnes & Noble, but I still had an, an employee discount. A lifetime employee discount and a bunch of friends that still work there and I had errands and places to do things that locations of my outward world that were all in the area of uh, of the potential Barnes and Noble most of them were even the Brattles only a few minutes walk away it's a nice thing about Boston uh, so I often went back in that store chat with people to shop of course there's something brand new that I want, now, maybe I'm not going to get it from a publisher, why buy it for full price on Amazon when I can go to that particular store and get a huge employee discount? Why would I do that? So I, I would often do that. I was a regular customer at that store, is what I'm trying to say. In addition to being, uh, it wanted to catch up with people that I knew, uh, I was also a regular customer. Uh, and then COVID hit, and for a long time I went nowhere, didn't go to any of those places nearby. Certainly didn't go to that Barnes & Noble, although that Barnes & Noble never closed. They they hung on. They implemented as many safeguards, safeguards as they could, and they hung on. Uh, those safeguards are largely gone now. The staff will put on a mask for you if you feel uncomfortable, but they're not required to do it otherwise. You're not required to do it at all as a customer. Uh, and I went in today at midday. Uh, this is a, a big, sprawling area full of uh, convention centers, restaurants, gigantic hotels, uh, high-priced condominiums. So a steady foot traffic of customers is predictable. That's why you would put a store in there, because you would looked at the surroundings and thought, yeah, we can support ourselves here. And I went in in the middle of the day with, keep in mind, the stock all discounted, because the store has announced that it's going out of business, so all the stock is discounted. And there was no one there. At all. I wish I could put a picture up here. I took a picture of it. Completely empty. As big as a football field. And completely empty. Except for staff. Uh, and I, I talked with some of those staff members, including one of those staff members who goes back all the way to, you know, 1990 in Barnes & Noble with me. So it was... I knew I wanted to get a selfie with anybody that I knew from the store I, because... The store is going to be gone. Uh, but I didn't expect that experience to hit me as hard as it did. Uh, it really felt uh, like a sad door closing in a way that leaving that information desk door for my last shift as a retail worker did not somehow feel. Because Barnes & Noble was going on. And Barnes & Noble, the company, is still going on, but not in Boston. Which means... It's entirely likely that I will never set foot in a Barnes & Noble again. I don't have a car, don't know how to drive, don't go anywhere. This Barnes & Noble was right there, plunk, in the middle of Boston. I, 
it's unlikely that I would go to any other Barnes & Noble, which means I, that might never happen. It might be the last time. And it's certainly the last time that I'll see any of these people, these old friends, these old former co-workers with, with just crowding, crowding ghosts of memories of all the adventures that we had, all the fun that we had, all the bad times, good times, all the people. Over years and years and years, all of that came to an end today. And that hit me harder than I was expecting that it would. It also made me reflect on Barnes & Noble in Boston. The Barnes & Noble has, uh, has written its own fate in Beantown. I don't believe that this was necessary. It may be that it was in the plans for cost-cutting reasons. Boston is a notoriously expensive city to live and do business. Uh, it could be that it was always in the plans just for chop shopping reasons. Barnes & Noble was recently bought by a hedge fund. They tend to chop things up and dispose of them. It could be that that's what they're doing here. Uh, it could be just a reflection of daily pragmatics. From the descriptions that I've had from a lot of you of your own local Barnes & Noble, this Barnes & Noble was simply failing. A lot of you report that your Barnes & Nobles are full. Nice traffic. Good, good representation of the, the buying public. Not this store. I, I've been in there many, many times. Nothing is quite as desolate as today. I looked at that store and thought, you can't have a store this big. Imagine the rent on this place and the utilities bills. A, spa a store, a space this big cannot be this empty for more than a spare minute at a time in any given day or you're going to start to go out of money. And it was like this. It was like that the whole time I was there. Uh... I steeled myself uh, and went in today mainly because I feel like the clock is ticking and this is exactly the sort of thing where I would lose track of time and the next time I look up, I'd have missed my chance to go in. So I made myself go in today partly for that and also partly because Boston this weekend is going to be genuinely hot and humid, not weather for walking around, not weather for doing any kinds of errands. And today was cool. Uh, so I went in and I said my goodbyes and I walked all around to see if I could buy something. As strange as it is, a, a particularly American capitalist way to say goodbye. I, I found some things that I want to show you. Not much, not much, considering that the books were all discounted on top of my discount. I didn't find much. Uh, there were no, uh, none of those fancy Barnes & Noble leather brown editions remained. I was told that all of the Barnes & Noble electronic readers, the Samsung-branded electronic readers, had all been boxed up and manifested to other stores. Not, not even there for me to look at. The, most of the, all of the blank journals, another impulse purchase I love at, used book, at bookstores, was gone. They were all gone. Most of the science fiction section was entirely gone. Most of the graphic novels were gone. Most of the nature books were gone. Uh, great swaths gone in fiction or history or the genres. So... I walked around a little, as much as I could take. Uh, by the time I finished, I honestly did think that I was going to start to cry. Uh, so I grabbed up everything that I wanted and brought them to the registers. There was no wait. There was one guy at the registers in the middle of the day. One guy at the registers, no wait. Just walked right up. Uh, he was behind his plexigla plexiglass screen. And I plunked everything down. And he said, you know, how did you find everything you want? I said, yes. And then I was just looking around. I was looking at the, the registers at the Prudential Center. Right next to the registers is the door to the back, to the break room and the managerial offices. I used to go through that door a hundred times a day for one reason or another. Uh, I was just staring at that door, at the windows, at all of these fixtures that I helped to put in place, that I helped to fill when that store was starting. Uh, and I, it wasn't, it wasn't, I needed a minute and I needed a, a polite repetition before I realized that he'd been talking to me. The clerk at the, at the register had been talking to me and I just totally zoned out. I apologized. And I told him that this is 1990. 1990 to now. That's a long time. Uh, I used my employee discount and I left and it's amazing to me still. It's still sitting with me. That Barnes & Noble, Barnes & Noble in Boston made a lot of serious, serious mistakes uh, that it need not have made. It was managed poorly. When they decided to vacate the old location in downtown Boston, 
uh, they moved all of the staff to the, the, this location at the Prudential Center, a much newer store, uh, rather than find a new location in Boston to keep two locations. The managerial decision seemed to be, well, this place was a nightmare. This landlord was insane. This physical plant was falling apart. So I guess they all will be. So we're not going to have a second Boston store. We'll just move you all to the Pru. Uh, that was a bad decision right there. Then once we were at the Pru, Barnes & Noble made its legendarily bad decision, what I consider to be the nail in the coffin, the reason why the original owners of the, ch of the chain eventually did sell to this uh this leverage company is because they made a disaster decision with the rollout of the Barnes and Noble electronic reader, the Nook. Uh, they decided to spend half a billion dollars on the rollout, the merchandise, and a you know the confident expectation of a miracle that they would that if they just presented this alternative to the Amazon Kindle, which was already a household name, people would flock to it. They didn't build that interest; they just assumed it would be there. And when it wasn't, the company took a bath. On that and that was that was bad management that could have been avoided same thing with this decision here uh, you've got a, a dedicated caring staff you have a few good managers you have a city that is legendarily literary and yet there never appears to have been any consideration that Barnes & Noble would would pick up from the Prudential Center and move to a smaller location but keep a Barnes & Noble in Boston that doesn't seem to have ever been considered Instead, this store will close and Bostonians will have no place to go for books. Uh, not the full panoply of new releases that you, we expect, that we think of when we think of a big new bookstore. Uh, don't know why that is, but all those things together just made this harder. I, I came back, honestly, I came back feeling miserable. Uh, I, I took advantage of uh, a surefire antidote to that. I harnessed up a uh, little bean. <laughs> I harnessed up the little bean and we went for a long and beautiful walk. And that also was partly spurred by uh, the calendar, by circumstance. Because we're not going to be able to do long, beautiful walks this weekend. That's out as, if it, as, as surely as if it were blizzarding. <laughs> it's going to be 100 degrees, so we're not going to be doing that. She is uh, a diehard little trooper. She is not delicate. She is as stubborn and uh, hardy as could be, but she does not handle heat well. Not big heat, and that's coming. So uh, we went out for a walk, and it was wonderful, <laughs> absolutely wonderful. It really did just wipe the slate clean. Uh, but I wanted to show you what I got. It's not much. Uh, it's it's just it means something to me because it's the last thing. It's almost certainly the last bag full of stuff that I will get at a Barnes and Noble. Certainly the last thing I'll get from that Barnes and Noble. In other words, from any Barnes and Noble where I have worked. Because I didn't leave these places. They left me. The downtown store is, when it, if it ever opens again, if that space ever opens again, it'll be something else. It won't be a bookstore. It won't belong to Barnes & Noble as a company. If it ever does open again, it's been 20 years that so it's been shuttered closed in the middle of downtown Boston. But if it ever does open again and I go in there, I can only imagine what I'll feel like walking to the back to the area where my information desk used to be. I, I can only imagine what I'll feel. Uh, but... There was that store that is never going to be a Barnes & Noble again. And then there's this Prudential store, which will never be a Barnes & Noble again, even if it's a bookstore. It won't be Barnes & Noble. Uh, that's what mainly gives these things of interest. Mainly, I got magazines. It's a huge newsstand. That's another thing that's gone, that'll be going from, from Boston, is a gigantic all-purpose newsstand. Nothing even remotely close to this one at this Barnes & Noble exists anywhere in in Boston, the closest that you could come to even a rough approximation would be out-of-town news in Cambridge across the river, but nothing in Boston. It's, just, it's kind of weird. Uh, it's just a negative de development, that's all. But I did get a book. I got a, a book uh, in paperback. I've praised this. Uh, I had the hardcover forever and ever here at Hyde Cottage. I, it's appeared in a couple of different library tours. Uh, I've praised it, and I didn't. I'd never seen the paperback before. I don't have the hardcover anymore. I got rid of it. It's World War II history. Uh, it's by Adam Makos, and it is Spearhead, uh, and it's about the Third Armored Division in World War II. One particular tank, one particular Sherman tank, uh, in World War II, uh, mainly at the Battle of the Bulge, but also in the the fight overland and for the city of uh, Cologne. And uh, Adam Makos 
researched the men here, their biographies, the, the technicalities of the tanks involved, not only the Sherman tank, but also the German Panther and a whole bunch of other tank developments. Also, a deep granular research on what happened in each town at each crossroads, who died and when and how. But once Makos had done all that research, he then decided to write this thing like a thriller. It's a work of history, but it is written thoroughly to entertain you. I've been over the sources here. This is not Bill O'Reilly type history. This is the real thing, but it is written like virtually no history is written in the modern times. Once upon a time, if you were Xenophon, for instance, or Herodotus, this was the only way you knew how to write history. Uh, or, or, or even much later than that, Thomas Carlyle's book, The French Revolution. But you usually don't see history written like this, and I know that I want to copy. I got rid of my hardcover. I probably sent it to one of you. Uh, but if you are a World War II fan and you haven't read this book, it'll be a, a World War II reading experience, the like of which you have not had. So I, I got this paper. It could have been anything, really, but... Uh, I left the book buying for the end of my visit, and by the end of the visit, I was feeling a lot rockier than I expected, so I just grabbed something that I knew I wanted enough. But all the rest are magazines. I got, for instance, New York Magazine, uh, which I'm going to have to subscribe to this. I don't, I don't get it anywhere else. The cover story is about people going back to the New York subway system. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the New York subway system, but it actually does. I mean, this is a, a mocked-up cover. But there, there actually are multi-layers multi in the New York subway system, unlike, for instance, the Boston subway system, where you go down into the subway, but that's it. You go down to the subway level, but you don't go to multiple levels. In many, many uh, subway entrances in New York, you go down to one level, but there are many levels below that. And, and a bewildering confusion of trains and lines and expresses and crosstowns and whatnot. Uh, so this article, I imagine, will have to do quite a bit with that, but also with, uh, you know, the weird psychology of people going back on the subway. There was just recently a shooting attack on a New York subway and a gas attack at the same time. But also just the idea of going back to the subways sort of after COVID-19, uh, everything gets heightened. I'm, I'm hoping that this is a nice rambling story about that. Uh and then there's, there'll be, you know, other stuff in here. There'll be all sorts of uh, New York-centered stuff of a type that I just love. I, I often like their, uh, their book coverage. I don't actually know what, what their book coverage is this time around. Uh, what are you, what are you uh, reviewing for books? Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't review books, which is kind of weird. Yeah, I don't see any... Uh, books coverage here. New York Magazine with no books coverage. Uh, but uh, I always enjoy it. When I get it, I always enjoy it. Uh, then uh, this, this next one was probably boneheaded. Probably I subscribed. Probably this is coming to me in the mail. Uh, this is the New Atlantic with a cover story about the abortion underground uh, inside the covert network preparing for a post-Roe future by Gen Jessica Bruder. Uh, I haven't read the piece. I can guarantee you that Jessica Bruder is not imagining how bad things are going to get. She's written a whole article for The Atlantic with tons of fact checkers on how bad things could get. And I guarantee you the article is timid when it comes to how bad things not only could get, but are going to get. Uh, but The Atlantic does have uh, books coverage. In fact, there was just a news story uh, recently about how they intend to increase their books coverage, which should be great. So this has a, a review of the new Elif Batcherman. They'll love it. I'm sure they will love it. Uh, there's an article called Privacy Isn't Dead, But Who Gets to Keep a Secret in a Hyperconnected World? That's reviewed by Sarah Ego, uh, or Igo. But I wonder if that is... Uh, I wonder if that's... Oh, well, that's page 80. I wonder if that's a review of the book that we have seen on this channel, Rewired. Uh, I wonder if it will tell me, too. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Uh, and, you know, this is, this has, the front articles will be interesting anyway. There's a reflection, a rumination here on the TV show Better Call Saul. Uh, there's a book about, uh, there's an article about uh, World War II 
the Atlantic never fails to, to interest me, so I, I grabbed it even though I'm pretty sure I already subscribe. Uh, and then I got two literary journals, explicitly literary journals. One that I read, uh, I bought a copy at Barnes & Noble. It's the only time I ever see it. I'll have to subscribe to it. Uh, I found a copy at Barnes & Noble months ago, and I read it. was not all that impressed. I thought I'd give it another try in case I got a bad issue. Uh, and it is just the literary review, which I don't write for. <laughs> I wish I did. And uh, the, the cover is about... Uh, that big, gigantic new translation of a biography of Empress Maria Theresa, which I didn't really like in the English version, and I wonder if maybe this review uh, will send me back to it. Uh, Britta Bowler said she liked it a lot when she read it years ago in, in German, uh, and I don't want to, I wanted to like it, and I know, I, when I was reading it, I knew that it was definitive. Uh, it just didn't strike me as very good, uh, but uh, what else have we got here? Uh, Shadowlands, a journey through lost Britain about uh, abandoned villages and, and towns. Uh, let's see here. A big biography, a big review of Maria Theresa. Lots and lots of reviews, though. Look at all of those. Uh, so I don't know why I wouldn't like this thing. I should like this magazine. Uh, I guess I'll just, I'll try it again and uh, and see yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot in here. Not a lot that that we have seen on this channel, but a lot that I want to uh, to read about and maybe read, maybe the books as well. So I will, if if this impresses me at all, I will I will just subscribe since I won't ever see it at a Barnes and Noble again. And then the final thing I got, another thing we've seen on this channel many times, the Claremont Review of Books, uh, which has a huge amount of writing and it just gigantic. One of those, one of those remaining literary journals where you really do get your money's worth. How much is this? Uh, Seven dollars. Seven dollars for all that, you know, double column type. And I mainly got this because uh, Gordon Wood, great historian, uh, and also a great writer of, of book reviews about books on the Re the American Revolution, uh, reviews Andrew Roberts' new biography of King George III. I would have bought this thing just for that anyway. But there's probably a lot of other things in here as well that I will like. Uh, and that is, that is it. I got the Claremont Review of Books, uh, the Literary Review, uh, The Atlantic, uh, New York Magazine, about subways, about the New York subway system, where I will never be again, uh, and, and Adam Makos' book Spearhead in paperback. Uh, and that was my final purchase. Almost certainly my final purchase at a Barnes & Noble. Uh, and certainly my final the final time that I will ever set foot inside that space, that old prudential space where all of us shipped over from that, the ragged old downtown store. When, it, when we were told it was closing, we all feared the worst and we were told, no, the worst isn't going to happen. We'll take care of you. Anybody who wants to go over to the Prue, you get the same number of hours, and roll over everything, just do different commute. That's all. We won't let anybody go. We'll keep everybody. Uh, so we all, uh, the core of us all moved over there. We've been, friends and co-workers for decades. We all just moved over there together. And now I'll never be back in that store. Very strange. Uh, so sorry, this has been a very discombobulated uh, video, but it felt natural to do, so to just to make a video about this change. This is a, a loss that's just happening. There's no way around it. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap this up for now. It's quite enough wool gathering, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.